Carpe Diem VPN. Seize the data. Hi, this is Tim. I'm a cloud network architect, and welcome back to this video series breaking down AWS networking for traditional network engineers. If you haven't watched it yet, I suggest starting at the beginning and catching up. Uh, there should be a link to that here, and it also should be in a playlist. In the last video, we talked about how AWS exposes route tables and allows you to create subnets for traffic flows in a single VPC. But now let's move on to multiple VPCs. Hmm, let's suppose that our organization has three VPCs built, each under the control of a different internal organization. A classic three-tier architecture here, where a web tier has a customer-facing website, which interacts with an application layer that does something with the data, transforming it or offering enhancements to the web experience, and the backend database that keeps all the information about the products, inventory, and orders. In this case, we might assume that the web VPC might need to send and receive traffic from the other two VPCs, and it's also possible that the app VPC may need to read or write or insert data from the database VPC. So we need all three of these VPCs to communicate. What's the easiest way? We can set up a VPC peering between the VPCs to allow them to, to communicate using the AWS Fabric. It's by far the simplest option, and it supports extremely high bandwidth. Let's walk through setting up a VPC peer between the web and app VPCs, and then we can talk about some of the reasons why VPC peering may not be a great idea at large scale. Okay, so at the VPC dashboard, we're gonna to go to peering connections and create a peering connection. We should give it a name, so I'll do web app peer. Next, we have to pick the VPC we'll initiate the peer request from. So I'm going to pick the app VPC in this case. Notice that the VPC IP cider shows up below, and that'll be important in a second. Next, I have the option to pick another VPC in my account or another account. In the example for the video, we'll be using the same account, just for simplicity's sake. But in the real world, of course, each VPC could belong to a different AWS account or department. For region, I'll pick this region. We can absolutely do inter-region VPC peering. There's a small list of caveats there around latency and uh, max MTU that's supported between MT AWS regions. But since our example VPCs are all in the same region, let's just pick the web VPC from the list. Notice the VPC IP cider is listed here too. This is really important because AWS does not support VPC peer requests that involve VPCs that have the same IP cider. So you can't peer two VPCs in any region or anywhere that have overlapping IPs. Okay, let's start this peer connection. Since we own both VPCs, we could actually just go ahead and accept this from the actions menu. If it were another account, that account owner would have to go in and accept the peering request. So what's actually happening here? Well, AWS is creating a fabric tunnel with endpoints between the two VPCs that you can use as a target for the route tables. It's a little bit like setting up a VXLAN VTEP and being able to use it as a next hop target for routing. As you can see, VPC peering is easy to set up, but it has some serious drawbacks. For one, VPC peering has a very low artificial limit of up to 125 VPC peer connections. And that alone doesn't seem too bad, but VPC peer connections are one-to-one -one connections. That means that VPC peering is not transitive. If I set up a peering from the database to the app VPC, that won't let me connect to workloads in the web VPC, even though the route tables would make it appear to let it work. AWS just won't forward the packets across the fabric that way. VPC peering can be done across accounts and across AWS regions as well, but it's not free in most cases. Within AWS, transfer within the same availability zone or AWS data center is free but crossing availability zones costs money, and peering across regions costs more. I want to keep bringing up costs as part of these network design discussions because I've seen a lot of networks built by a lot of organizations that technically work, but are fairly cost inefficient in the cloud. Okay, so I went ahead and built a full mesh VPC peering, but the workload still won't be able to communicate until I set up the route tables to direct the traffic. Remember that route tables are like VRFs, and just like route tables on a router, packets will not be forwarded if there's no routes in the rib. AWS does not dynamically add VPC ciders to route tables when creating VPC peers, so you have to do that part yourself. To keep things simple, let's assume each VPC only needs to be able to communicate with the other from private workloads, and nothing within the public subnets. That's a normal setup anyway. So we'll walk through editing a route table on both sides to set up basic connectivity. Since we have custom route tables, we'll edit them directly. 
I need to choose the private subnet route table, so let's edit that. The route table only has the local VPC CIDR entry, but we're going to add a route to the other VPC. So we go to add route. We're going to add the IP CIDR of the other VPC, the peered VPC. And from the target, we choose the peering connection. Now we only have one, so pick that. And we're done. So now we need to do the same on the web VPC route table by adding a return route to the app VPC with the target of that same peer connection. So remember if you're using multiple custom route tables that each route table that you want to be able to communicate with the peered VPC needs to be updated as well. Okay, there are a couple things to think about here. One, the VPC peering itself is tied to the VPC and not to a particular AZ or availability zone but AWS will intelligently keep traffic between workloads in the same AZ in the same AZ. You won't have to get creative with the route tables and subnets and guarantee same AZ traffic flows as long as it's a single AWS account. However, there is something to be aware of here, and that is cross-account VPC peering. AWS load balances customers over its different data centers by pseudo-randomizing each customer's availability zone mapping. That means one account's AZA might actually be a different physical data center than another account's AZA. To help streamline the cross-account data transfer optimization, AWS lets you find your availability zone ID, and this helps you make sure that when doing cross-account data transfer that you're using the same DC as other accounts, saving you some cross-AZ transfer charges. In this case, you might have to coordinate between accounts and actually do subnet level route tables to direct the traffic. For example, in this diagram, workloads in the database VPC and app VPC are mapped to the same availability zones, and therefore no adjustments are necessary. But traffic between the web VPC and both the app and database VPCs are going to need subnet level route table manipulation to stay within the same availability zone. One last big restriction to consider with VPC peering. The AWS constructs in one VPC are not available for use from a peered VPC. So a NAT gateway that's in the web VPC is not available to use from a workload in the app VPC, even if you add a default route pointing at that VPC peer connection in the app VPC. This is true for pretty much every first party CSP native service that AWS offers. They're not consumable by other VPCs across a peering connection. What you could do instead is build an EC2 instance like a squid proxy that does the basic same thing that an AWS NAT gateway does, and that should work. I think that's enough for this video. You can see that even basic connectivity between VPCs can start to get a little complex, depending on how you need to engineer your traffic. Next time, let's talk a little bit about what an AWS Transit Gateway is and some very basic things you can do with them because the TGW is going to take multiple videos to cover. I hope this helped, and thanks for watching.